I think we're in Cold War Two. We've been in Cold yeah. War Two for yeah. about five years. Yeah. Uh, People's Republic of China has taken the place of the Soviet Union. The United States is still the superpower of the Western world. And as in Cold War One, there are certain, I think, clear implications of that, because this is a Cold War that is, that is ideological in nature. Xi Jinping makes it very clear that he's against democracy, he's against the rule of law, he's against individual freedom. It's also technological, like the first Cold War. It's a race, not just for nuclear weapons, though it is that, but it's also a race in artificial intelligence and quantum computing. It's、mm-hmm. geopolitical. It's about particular regions, flashpoints such as、uh, as Taiwan, and it's economic because China is a much larger economy than the Soviet Union、mm-hmm. ever was. So this is Cold War Two now. Cold wars are not entirely cold. One characteristic feature of the first Cold War was that there were hot wars here and there.、Uh, the first hot war was really in Korea. I think Ukraine is really the Korea of our times. It's a war that broke out、uh, to the great surprise of many people in the West.、It、didn't surprise me because I think Putin, President Putin, made his intentions pretty clear.、Uh, but it was a revelation, and it made many people realize. Uh, that the stakes are higher than they thought, and that the other side is prepared to fight dirtier than they expected. President Putin would not have invaded Ukraine without a green light from Xi Jinping. He would not be able to sustain his war effort without very large-scale exports、uh, from China to Russia of dual-use technologies, things that may be civilian in、uh, one place but can equally well be used in the battlefields、uh, of Ukraine. So that's point one. As in Cold War One, the Middle East is a really important place because, despite the best intentions of the Greens, we are still a hydrocarbon fueled world, and that is still the place where the most crude oil is in the ground. And and that means that, as in Cold War One, so in Cold War Two, the Middle East is of huge strategic importance, and any. Collision there, any eruption there has geopolitical ramifications. This is not just Iran backing its proxies to carry out an attack on、uh, Israel. Russia plays a part in this story too, because Russia has air defense systems in Syria that can track every Israeli warplane the minute it takes off. So geopolitically, we've got to adjust to the fact. That we're back in that world、mm-hmm. that you and I grew up in, and we thought it had gone away in 1989 or maybe in 91 when the Soviet Union、mm. fell apart, and we thought we were going to have this endless peace dividend, and everything was going to be awesome. There would be only one superpower; it would be the United States, and we would live happily ever after. And globalization would make us all rich, and it would be win-win with the Chinese. We believed that、yeah. from the 1990s、mm. through. The first part uh, of uh, this new century, and the scales only fell from our eyes quite recently,、uh, and that I think is where we are. These three theaters of conflict: number one, Ukraine in Eastern Europe; number two, on Israel; number three, potentially the next shoe to drop, Taiwan, are not separate. They're part of a global struggle for power, and that struggle is fundamentally between the free world. As was true in the first Cold War, and an unfree world with a bunch of ideologies of which communism, Marxism, Leninism is still one that are deeply hostile to the notion of individual liberty. I think it's just hard for us to accept that we're back there, and that the interwar period is over. But that's the reality. So the Ukraine is critically important because if we stop supporting it and it fails and the Russians succeed. They've got their first major stroke against us, so it's really a conflict for the whole of the free world, and we need to keep that in mind. Will that be a fair assessment? Well, I think it's all too likely that Ukraine will lose、uh, on our present trajectory, because we have given the Ukrainians up until this point enough weaponry not to lose, but not enough to win. If our interest wanes, and it is clearly waning amongst Republican voters and Republican politicians in the United States, if support wanes, 
and it could be cut off if Donald Trump is re-elected president in November of 2024, then I don't see how Ukraine can win. In fact, it seems to me that it's quite likely uh, that Ukraine loses. We have reached a very critical point in that conflict. A stalemate has been arrived at. The Ukrainians themselves yeah. acknowledge this. Their offensive this summer achieved far less than they had hoped. In terms of raw resources, it's David v. Goliath. But at this point, Goliath looks more and more the likely favorite. If Russia wins this war, or if it, to put it very, very modestly, if it is able to retain control of those parts of Ukraine that it currently does control, that land bridge, so-called, that extends right down Definitely. to Crimea, which it annexed in 2014, that will be the first big defeat of Cold War II for the West, because we were all in. We were all in in our support for Zelensky. How many speeches did Western leaders make in support of Ukraine? How many promises did they make? How many pledges were there to be there for as long as it took? If we lose, our credibility is shot. And then turn to the Middle East. What if there is an all-out multi-front assault on Israel? The Israeli defense forces are stretched to breaking point and the United States does not intervene simply carries on lamely calling for some kind of diplomatic resolution. What if those aircraft carrier strike groups just sit there and do nothing to impact Iran, the sponsor of this multi-front attack? Then what? You'll have lost Ukraine as an independent state, potentially. Then the fate of Israel hangs in the balance. It would be surprising, wouldn't it, if Xi Jinping didn't take the opportunity to add Taiwan uh, to the strategic mix, because how exactly would the United States respond if Taiwan were blockaded by China tomorrow? I don't like to think how the conversation in the Situation Room would go, as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs explained that it would be rather difficult to send another major naval expedition across the Pacific to run that blockade, particularly because if that were to trigger hostilities between the US and China, a much larger war would ensue than anything we've seen so far. So this is a very dangerous moment in world history. And I think we've stumbled into it, partly by forgetting the lessons of Cold War I. And the most important lesson of Cold War I was you must have credible deterrence. You must credibly deter the Russians or Soviets as they were then from sending their forces uh, into Western Europe, from intervening, which they nearly did, in 1973 in the Middle East. We've lost that credible deterrence. We failed to deter President Putin from invading Ukraine. We are failing to deter Iran now from attacking Israel through its proxies. And I really worry, John, that we're gonna to fail to deter China from making a move against Taiwan. And in that scenario, the West will find itself in a worse situation than it was at any time in the first Cold War.